Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 90. I am joined once again, or I should say probably kind of for the first time, but uh, uh, joined with my new co-host, uh, Omar Ansari. Welcome back, Omar. <laughs> hey, Parvez. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Excellent. I'm glad to be here. It's an uh, exciting new project we're taking on. That's right. Uh, I've been super looking forward to this. We we enjoyed a little bit of a winter break, so that explains the uh, the the absence for a few weeks. But we're back, and we are super excited about the new year. And uh, um, kind of wanted to keep this episode between me and Omar because I figured, you know, much like we like to do, we sort of uncover and, and discuss people's origin stories and backstories and what, what 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 they do. And I figured this would be a good opportunity for our listeners to uh, get to know Omar a little bit. So um, you are center stage, my friend. Well, I'm, uh, I don't know about origin story. I'm definitely no superhero. <laughs> uh, there's lots of other superheroes in the community, but I'm happy to be here. Uh, excited to partake in the show going forward with you. And uh, it was an interesting conversation about, you know, me joining and, yeah. and whether I should do that and what, what value I could bring. So... Um, you know, we can we can share a little about that process. Yeah, but. yeah. In fact, before I guess we even talk kind of about the quote unquote origin story, um, maybe yeah, tell me a little bit about your thoughts uh, when I did approach you with the idea of of joining. Uh, um, I mean, it's no secret to the listeners. I mean, Zucky um, uh, decided to focus on other endeavors, and uh, obviously, uh, Zucky's indelible impact on the show will always be there, um, and hopefully, a, re- a, re- a, re- a returning voice at some point um, in terms of uh, as a guest or what have you. But um, yeah, what, when I kind of approached you with the idea of joining on as a co-host, um, yeah, tell me kind of how you like processed that, and what was sort of the calculus of you kind of finally agreeing to to participate. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, it, it does tie into who I am and, and my relationship to you and to Zucky. So you and I are cousins. Right. Uh, we go way back. Really, you're an extended part of the family, uh, the whole Ansari clan. Likewise. But uh, And Zucky and I are, are brother-in-laws. He's married to my, uh, my baby sister, Amina. So I've been involved in the show in the sense that I'm a listener from the very get-go and kind of having offline discussions with you guys as, as things have progressed. Uh, Zucky got me into podcasting when he when he launched his film podcast, the movie film podcast. I hadn't even heard of the what a, uh, the concept of a podcast. So really, um, getting exposed to the concept and then helping my commute, my hour long commute in the Silicon Valley uh, through podcasting. And now I'm an avid listener of podcasts. Uh, I listen to podcasts really more than any other type of media, more than more than I stream Netflix, more than I listen to Spotify, what have you. But so there's a relationship there uh, with you guys. And um, I'm just definitely interested in podcasts. Uh, I'm def- I'm definitely no expert on Islam or scholar of Muslim American culture, or anything like that. So I was a little hesitant when you said, hey, would you like to join? Um, I'm not somebody who necessarily loves the spotlight. I've I've been on a board of a of a Muslim organization briefly, um, real solid Muslim organization. They asked me to join based on knowing some of the board members, but after a while, I did find myself feeling like somebody else could do the job better um, because I didn't have the expertise that they necessarily needed, and I didn't want to just be filling a seat because of my ego or because of whatever reason, right? So I did I did leave that, and I do believe that our Muslim communities, our Muslim orgs need expertise. Having said that, you convinced me that this could be fun because number one, we do have a lot of chemistry. You and I go way back. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I said, part of the family, my closest cousin, no offense to any other cousins listening. Uh, and we have, so we, there's a chemistry there and just a, a banter that we, I think goes well. Um, but also I'm a listener of the show. I'm inter- interested in the topic. Of course, I have, I have, you have to have a bit of passion about the topic if you're going to do something like this. Agreed. And then we talked about since I don't have that masters in uh, Islamic uh, Islamic theory or anything like, what can I? What value can I bring? And this is something um, other people could bring too. But I, I do bring a curiosity. Mm. Uh, and the other thing I potentially bring is the ability to speak for just the average Muslim. Mm. Ask those questions that maybe the average Muslim is thinking. Somebody who's who grew up in a small American town, uh, which I'll, which I'll, yeah. I'll talk a little about. I definitely want to talk but about just that. that. Just that. Just that curiosity and that that average Muslim viewpoint. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, and and that certainly was. I mean, again, when I was when when Zaki and I had that conversation about him 
possibly stepping away, um, you know, my ma- my mind began to wander in terms of, okay, well, you know, how do we find someone who can bring something to the show? Um, and the reason for reaching out was kind of, you know, along the same lines of what you already talked about. I mean, you and I go way back. We have a history, um, certainly. Um, we, we know each other really well. So I, so I assumed uh, that the chemistry would be there on mic as it were. Um, and then, and then of course, um, I, I also appreciated the fact that, um, while I don't, I mean, neither of us can sort of claim any sort of level of expertise about Islamic law or theory or history or anything like that. But I think that, um, um, our, 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 our experiences while shared, there are also, they are, they are also kind of unique to each of us. Like your background is very dissimilar from mine in the sense that I grew up in a big city with a, with a huge Muslim community, a burgeoning growing Muslim community. I've lived and moved around in so many different parts of the country. And so I've experienced a lot of the Muslim community and, 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 and certainly, um, you know, I came of age in the nineties and nineties Islam in America and all of that sort of background. Um, what I appreciated of, in terms of your own background was again, like I said, because you were dissimilar to that in the sense of growing up in a small town in Washington primarily, um, and, and not really living around a large, you know, growing Muslim community. I mean, certainly you've been in the Bay now for a while. So you, you had that experience as well, um, that I, that, that, that I felt would be a sort of a unique voice to the show. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that's kind of why I reached out. Yeah. I'm happy happy to talk a little about that. So please, on, on one hand, I have the typical, uh, yeah. Child, child, child of immigrants story. My dad and mom are both from Hyderabad, India. You know, they came, my dad came over to go to Berkeley in 1964, September 1964. He came over on a plane, flew on a helicopter from San Francisco to, to Berkeley or some, maybe Oakland. Uh, but he basically flew across the bridge on a helicopter. This would, this would have been 1964, 60s? September 1964. And he saw Joan Baez on campus. And um, if you look at the pictures, it looks very different than what a Berkeley class picture looks like right now. It's basically all these Caucasian students in like nice pre, pre-hippie pre clothes, right? And then there's my dad, um, the one non-Caucasian uh, brown person in the photo, very different than Berkeley now, right? But he came over here to study and and went back to have an arranged marriage with my mom in night, summer 1967. So very, very typical in that regard. Mm-hmm. Um, and the seventies, I would say, were probably very much like any any um, any any Indian family Muslim Indian family that came over here. They lived in Houston and New Orleans, among a few other places. So kind of, kind of, and then, but what happened was they went to Saudi Arabia for a while. And then when they came back, things took a very different turn. Uh, We moved to Spokane, Washington, Mm -hmm. which um, is not your typical American town um, for Muslims. Muslims were living in Chicago and Houston and, and other places. I'm sure other, I'm sure we have Muslim listeners here who lived in small towns, but Spokane was super isolated. This is the largest city between Minneapolis and Seattle, but there's five hours between Seattle and Spokane and on the, on the West and on the East side, it's like more than a day's drive. And in the middle and you have Montana and Idaho. So growing up, um, it was a 99.9% Caucasian place, very isolated. This is pre-internet. Um, so I was I was the brown kid uh, in school. I was the I was I act probably I think I represented the African American community and the Asian community and the non uh, non uh, non Christian community kind of in yeah. all. So um, it, was, it was a really really unique experience. But um, I somehow made it work. Uh, I I I I I was there until twenty four, and I had had a lot of good friends, and I basically lived uh, a regular s- small town. Uh, American life. We we were playing basketball. We were jumping off off rocks into the river and floating down on on inner tubes and climbing um, climbing hills and all the usual stuff that you do. It's almost like stand. It reminds me of Stand by Me or something. So very very just average American town. No Muslims. Uh, my parents were very practicing Muslims. On the other hand, we, and we were super proud to be Muslims. So it's not like we were. Um, out of touch with our Muslim identity by any means. We were super in touch with our Muslim identity and maybe even more so because we had to hold on to it so so strongly. Mm. Well, so if you were to think back to your earliest memories, uh, are they of not, I wouldn't imagine New Orleans or Houston, probably the Middle East or what? 
Uh, earliest memory. So, so yeah. So we lived in Houston in the seventies, um, and then eighty to eighty four, we were in Saudi Arabia. My right. dad got a job at the King Fahad University of Petroleum Minerals, K- KFUPM. There, you were born in New Orleans, and I was born in New Orleans. That's right. Um, but yeah, where, I mean, where our where our stories intersect because um, yeah, like I was less than a year old when we moved to New Orleans, and I don't know if we ever actually our families overlapped necessarily. But I mean, you were born a couple of years after me. But I mean, you know, I think some of the earliest photographs we have together are of like your older brother's Bismillah. And I would be if, yeah, I was probably like three. You were a newborn. Yeah. That kind of story. Some of the oldest yeah. memories are with you, actually. <laughs> well, that, that's same. just the truth. Like in, in, because we used to visit yeah. from Saudi Arabia and, and come to Houston. Um, the Saudis, I guess, didn't want us in, 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 in over there in the summer. And well, and we, the expatriates have to like leave that's right, that's and right. things like that. And, but they paid for all the flights. So oh, yeah. that was good. So we would come over we uh we went to a lot of places from Saturday, but houston was definitely a staple now your father's background is in engineering but but he had kind of uh gone the way of academia mm-hmm. even starting with yeah. saudi arabia yeah so he the way the reason yeah. we ended up in yeah. spokane is because he's, my, he's next, a, he, my, my next question he yeah. got a, a tenured prof, uh, professorship at gonzaga university now if you're a basketball fan you know what that is uh if you're not a basketball fan you never heard of it <laughs> they are a small jesuit school yeah. Very Catholic, very uh, Jesuit, meaning um, the, you know the Catholic uh, sister school. school to Georgetown. Sister school oh. to yes, yeah. you could say Georgetown, Santa Clara, mm-hmm. any Jesuit d- school. Uh, it, they all belong in 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 a in a conference. Uh, but but yeah, he's a professor there. Actually, actually he's, he's still I shall still teaching, mm-hmm. uh, but very close to retirement. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But yeah, my earliest memories are, are some some of our trips to Houston. That's right. Um, some of my fondest memories. Yeah, and and uh, in fact. We could, you know, we have there's there's a a slew of trips through the years that are all like markers in, in our in our growing up, in right? Our, in our respective evolutions. Yeah yeah, 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 exactly. And I know the last episode we talked about Star Wars, but Star Wars was a, a part of that uh, experience. A lot of those experiences. That's right. Certainly the early Star Wars and coming more from. Um, from you and, and my brother, I should say, Najib was he was a a core member of the trio growing up. That's right. But uh, yeah, Indian movies uh-huh. like Amitabh Bachchan movies. I, I I would say I you know growing up I was I got less interested in in the Indian movies uh, compared to, uh, but those those were there in the beginning the the Shole and the That's right. and the Shan and all that. Um, but uh, and then of course music was yeah. you know the Duran Duran That's right. all that in the in the early eighties. That's right. But yeah, we so we were in Spokane from eighty eighty six on mm-hmm. eighty six to two thousand. I lived in Spokane, so all my formative years, uh, you know, junior elementary, junior high, high school, college at Gonzaga. I went to Gonzaga, right. uh, but we used to come to Houston. Mm-hmm. Um, so just in terms of touching base with Burbank. This is pre-internet. We can WhatsApp each other or social media yeah. each other the way I have our letters kids do. that we used to write to one That's another. right. That's right. Um, but came in 89, which I was 13 years old. And that was a formative year. That was, truthfully, that was possibly due to the influence of you and your slightly older, you know, your friends were older than me and you're a couple years older than me. But that's like, when we started praying, like yeah. that was, Hey, I saw these older guys praying and I was like, cool, let me join in. Yeah. Um, I came again in 95 mm-hmm. and six years had passed. We were college students. So that was also formative in some way. Right. Because, um, in college, your, your, your discussions are different. And mm-hmm. so we, t- we reconnected and, and, and that was another formative. We were at each other's weddings. And then of course, in 2009, you moved here. That's so right. that's, it's that's been right. obviously, yeah. um, my, my 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 connection to the Bay Area, yeah, exactly. I actually began. Well, I mean, I'd come here. I think in the '80s when I was a child. I I, I barely remember that um, trip. Although uh, I had come in 2000, we we or 2002, end of 2001, beginning of 2002, because we brought in the New Year's together right here mm-hmm. in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was my wife and I made the trip out here. It was a road trip, and we just had a great time. And it was always sort of like a dream, and this kind of like oh, you know, like California dream, and as they say, right? It was like wow, the Bay Area, you know, moving out here. And so in 2009, after law school and everything, when the opportunity presented itself, I, I knew I had a, I, I knew I had a family base because you and your siblings were here. Uh, and that meant a lot to us coming here. Um, and, and you guys were really, really uh, generous in terms of um, introducing us to so many people and, and really allowing us to acclimate to the Bay Area. Um, and then of course, then our, our, you know, just sort of living together and growing up and, or our kids growing up together mm-hmm. and things like that. But, uh, and, and, you know, it's really, this kind of mm-hmm. touches on, um, on the, our interaction with the Muslim community. So yeah, I wanted to talk yeah. like, as if you, like, mm-hmm. if you, uh, I, I don't know where you were going, but 
maybe uh, if I could tease a little bit mm -hmm. of the conversation, growing up in Gonzaga, you know, in this sort of small town, sorry, growing up in Spokane, attending Gonzaga or just you living in Spokane as a middle school or elementary school, high school, um, you know, what were your, what would you say, if anything, if you had a connection to the greater, broader Muslim community in America? Like was ISNA a thing? Was you know, were, were some of the sort of keynote speakers at ISNA, were they on your radar? Yeah. So my parents were very, very practicing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, you know, they had gone, my mom had gone to, my mom, my, both my parents had gone to Saudi Arabia and my mom had come back wearing hijab. And so it was, a, it was, a, it was very important in the family. Um, so I wasn't like totally uh, ABCD, I guess you could say, or whatever, yeah. whatever the term is. I was very much aware of being Muslim. Mm -hmm. Um, plus having an older brother and sister who didn't grow up in so much in Spokane. They had lived in Houston as older children. Uh, they were very much aware of their Heather Bobby and Muslim identity. So I wasn't, I wasn't completely unaware, but I was just your average kids doing all these, doing things like sports and all, but comic I did books. comic. Oh, how could I forget? <laughs> of course, comic books. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but there was, the, there were a few connections, uh, aside from parents my brother had an influence on me and he was, he was very much into that, I, the, his Muslim identity. Very much, yeah. Other than that, I had sports heroes. Mm. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, first. Um, Hakeem Olajuwon in the early 90s. For sure. I read the autobiography of Malcolm X in 1992, just before, by chance, just before the movie came out. Mm. So I read the book, it had a huge impact on me. Mm. And then... Then the movie came out and I, I doubled down on that. So I would be wearing, I wear, I would literally wear Malcolm X t-shirts to school. And, um, and I don't think, uh, I don't think anybody really had a clue what, what that was in, in, in my high school. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so I had, I had those sports figures, Cat Stevens. We'd, we'd listen to Cat Stevens, Yusuf Islam music, yeah. um, growing up. You didn't mention Mahmoud Abdurov. I know he was one of your sports heroes. Absolutely, well. yeah. yeah. And I and uh, I got to actually uh, see him, meet him in person uh, yeah. at the MCA. Uh, Hopefully, the, future guest on the show. Yeah. Inshallah, yeah. that that would be yeah. awesome. Yeah. So yeah, so I had sports figures, and then like I said, yeah. Aside from um, family and some of these things, and like the autobi autobiography of Malcolm X, um, the trips the trips to Houston mm. were impactful for sure. Right? Mm. Imagine. Imagine you're growing up in Spokane, but your parents say, hey, go to spend the summer with, with your cousin in Houston. And, and actually, I stayed with you for more, more than a month um, at a time, on, at a time mm -hmm. right? So having that and kind of seeing what was possible or what, you know, what it was like on the other side, if you yeah. will. I remember in 1999, I was working in Spokane. I got a job after studying engineering in Spokane. I went to ISNA and I was, I was single. Uh, my my parents basically laid the law down, like do not date a local a local uh, non Muslim girl. So that wasn't, and I was pretty pretty uh, uh, pretty obedient, I guess you could say. Pretty, yeah, I was practiced. It was very much in the family, like here's black, it's black and white. Do not cross this line. Right. And and for the most part, I I didn't I didn't cross cross that line. But but uh, yeah, so I went ninety nine. I went to Isna, and it was like, oh my god, this is actually going on. Um, and, and I'm not part of this. So I, I came back and I was 23 at the time. I came back and said, you know, next, by next year, this time, I want to, I want to be in a, in a, in a bigger community. I want, you know, time to grow up and, mm -hmm. uh, say bye to the home. And, and, uh, so yeah, a year later, peak of the Silicon Valley bubble, October, 2000, I moved out here and I had skipped all the, the whole, all the experiences that you went through the, the whole, the nineties and kind of the, you know, Salafism got coming yeah. and going. I kind of missed out on that. In some ways I was, at the time I was like, oh man, I wish I was in a Muslim community. And, other, and, and looking back, I'm like, maybe that was a good thing because I had this very innocent, pure mm -hmm. um, vision of Islam. When I came out here, I didn't really know what to expect. Yeah. I was actually kind of surprised when I saw that not every Muslim was perfect. Mm -hmm. um, even like when I saw uh, girl, you know, guys and gals, like interacting. interacting, I was like, hmm, interesting. That's not what I thought it'd be like. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I had to learn a little late. Um, yeah, some of those things. But it was yeah. So then nine eleven happened, and um, I I I I got introduced to things like ING. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So hopefully one day we'll have the founders of ING on the show. We, they can talk a little about that story. 
great organization. I, I became a speaker there. And then when you visited, you said, hey, I want. I really need, you had this camcorder and you said, I really need to go to Zaytuna College. Zaytuna, uh, Zaytuna, Zaytuna Institute. Institute, right? That's right. This, so th- this was the 2001 trip that yeah. we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So tell that story, and then I'll tell I'll tell my perspective. <laughs> well, I have too. two I, I, two memories came to mind as you were talking. Uh, one was dragging a very very jet lagged Omer to Dallas. Do you remember that? Yes. When I, that would have been that would have had to have been 99. It was 98 or 99. Um, it was uh, I think February 99. Wow. Okay. So February 99. <laughs> I remember we were in, you, you visited me in Houston. I, I think you had come from like Brazil. That's or, right. Yeah, yeah. You were super jet lagged. But I dragged you along with another friend of mine, uh, Amar Ansari. Um, uh, no, no relation to you, yeah. but, but someone you know. Um, me uh, and Amar and yourself, um, uh, I dra- again, you were, I don't know how much you, but you remember because you were pretty jet lagged. I remember it. I yeah, remember yeah, it. I dragged you to Fort Worth, um, or it was Dallas or Fort Worth, because there was a conference going on there. And it was a Sharia, Sharia Scholars of North America conference. Sana was the name of that organization. And I made that trip uninvited purely just going there because I wanted to meet uh, Sherman Jackson, yeah. Abdul Hakim Jackson. Uh, Dr. Jackson had, had already been on my radar. I had been exposed to his writings um, and and just, I was just fascinated with everything about Dr. Jackson and which played a huge, huge, huge role in my life um, uh, starting from that period. But, but nonetheless, anyway, dragging you to this conference and um, I, I got maybe 10 minutes or 15 minutes with him and then that was it, you know, and I think I, I sat in on a few lectures, but um, I, I did that. So that was one memory that came to mind. Um, in terms and, of, and the funny thing about yeah, that, it, yeah. just to show you like, and this kind of ties into how we're bringing different viewpoints yeah. to the show, right? Um, uh, I mean, alhamdulillah, today we're yeah. kind of aligned in, exactly. in, in everything in terms of our, the way we, but I was coming from literally a trip with coworkers to Rio de Janeiro for, for carnival week. I mean, it was, it wasn't wild and crazy like you would think because I was with coworkers, and, yeah. but nonetheless, and yeah. then I'm coming back and you're taking me to a, a Sharia conference four hours away. So what that did was yeah. that just kept me exposed mm-hmm. to, okay. Um, I'm in, I'm kind of just, you know, doing my thing in Spokane, yeah. very a small town, but there's all this is happening. So I had this like, um, this this message kind of going on in the back of my head. This, yeah. this talk saying, "Okay, you're in, you're there now in Spokane, kind of isolated, but there's a, this whole other world, and one day you will be a part of it." That's right. Right. So there was the night. There was that. There was that uh, February '99 mm-hmm. <laughs> to, uh, trip, I guess you could say, to yeah. see Dr. Jackson. Yeah. And then there's Isna. Yeah. Uh, and then and then in 2000. That's right. When so, you visited. Right. So when I visited here in 2001, um, and again the purpose was just to spend time with the family here. You and your siblings. Your your parents were also visiting, um, and it was a great opportunity to bring the New Year's together. Um, yeah, I Zaytuna Institute had already come on my radar. Um, they had done, I think the days of Allah or remembering the days of Allah had already been a big conference that I remember again, sitting in Houston going, Oh man, wow. I it would, you know, wouldn't it be amazing to attend a conference like that? Sheikh Hamza, I mean, certainly had already been on my radar, um, beginning in the mid nineties because of ISNA. And so, you know, um, it was literally like this, this picture of the Bay area as being this idyllic Muslim community, because you had this great organization called Zaytano Institute. So anyway, I, I coming here and then I remember asking you like hey, I, I got to go to Zaytuna Institute you got to take me there and if I recall you had you had not heard of Zaytuna Institute did, did you know Sheikh Hamza was that someone like a name I, I think you had heard? it was a vague like I had heard of it right. I didn't really know exactly what it was Hamza, uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf had seen at Isna, so I definitely know who he was. But you hadn't seen him here. But even, not locally. Because you were attending MCA. That was kind of your mom. Yeah, so I had moved here about a year plus prior to that. And thank God, I right away uh, got connected with the right people. Yeah, you did. Uh, one of my very best friends uh, happened to be the person who interviewed me for the job I applied for. I met him at the job, and he basically connected with me, uh, connected with me on the very first day of work that night to like... 10 other brothers who are still my very close friends to this day. Nice. Uh, now, post... Uh, post uh, Children uh, and marriage. Yeah, but and, they're, yeah. they're not even in the Bay Area. Uh, post gotcha. uh, Silicon Valley <laughs> bubble, they're all over the world. But <laughs> yeah. that kind of, that could have, that was a pivotal moment because I could have come here and just not met anybody True. and and just been like, not much different than than Spokane, right? Um, but I, I got connected with the right people. But then, you know, a year goes by, 9-11 happened. That was, a, that was kind of an, uh, a wake-up call because I... 
started questioning things like, hmm, let me learn a little more. I don't really know enough about Islam to, yeah. to be able to answer these questions. So I was starting to get a little involved with like ING, for example. Got it. But yeah, I do remember you were you yeah. were like, let's go there. I'm like, sure, let's go. If Barbara wants to go there, that's cool. We'll yeah. go. You know? I think I knew what the address was. You knew what the address they, was. Because they tuna had a website. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, it was rainy. It was a super rainy day. And you pull out this like super bulky camcorder. And I'm like, this is interesting. This guy's really excited about this place. This must be, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna pay a little close attention. Yeah. And we go there and nobody's there. Nobody's it's, there. It's locked, it's raining. Mm -hmm. And you are like, you are like, there's total glee, like glee. What's the word I'm yeah, looking at? You're no, like, I was, on cloud I was nine. ecstatic. Ecstatic. I was ecstatic. Yeah, I you're was, ecstatic. Yeah. You're videotaping, um, you know. The premises. I, yeah. I, I remember putting, uh, holding the handy cam that you yeah, were describing the handy cam. Yeah. To, the, to, to the window so I could see the inside. Because again, I had seen pictures on the website. Yeah. And, um, you know, again, it was, yeah, it was almost like this uh, pilgrimage. Pilgrimage. pilgrimage yeah. yeah. So after that, that was literally like late December. Yeah. So right away it after was. that, I was like, I mean, I need to find out more about this place. Mm. And I signed up for two classes. Nice. Um, literally two classes at Zaytuna Institute. One was uh, with Th Dr. Thomas Cleary. Wow. And the other one was with Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, the rights and responsibilities of marriage. And I was having it after attending those. And then I was, I was hooked from that point on. I was completely floored, especially by the Sheikh Hamza class. Yeah. And literally for the next... Um, Definitely the next, I'm going to say the next year, year and a half. I was like there every weekend. Mm. Um, you know. Now trying, we've had previous guests guest on the show yeah. who were kind of, you know, part of the organization mm -hmm. as it were, yeah. right? I mean, you know, Brother Yusuf, yeah. um, obviously, you know, some of the faculty members we've yeah. had at Zaytuna. But I mean, I guess they would just be people in the backdrop for you. I didn't, I didn't socially really yeah, connect. I think, I think. Growing up in Spokane, religion was always very private for me mm -hmm. because I was the only Muslim. I didn't speak about religion. Mm -hmm. So I'd go to Zaytuna, partake in the class and leave. Mm -hmm. It was, I didn't necessarily um, it, connect with everybody because, you know, it, it just was, it was just a very personal, private thing. And I was went there for a spiritual experience. So there's a lot of people who I met, I, I was on a salam basis with, but I didn't really intimately get to know them through the years. Um, for sure. So, but it was definitely, definitely a great experience. And, and um, I'm definitely no, no scholar, but that experience did change my lens. So I, 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 I saw it anyway, to kind of look through, uh, look at the world through the, through the eyes of like a, a Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. I, you know, I was like, wow, he sees the world in a way that I want to see the world. So that, that's what my takeaway is. I honestly don't remember a lot of the fiqh or anything like that. I also sh shout out to uh, Dr. Yusuf Ismail. Yeah. I uh, took a, um, Maliki fit course with him, right? right? And uh, that was also really, really uh, helpful and um, beneficial. Again, don't necessarily remember every aspect of the fiqh, but just being there and, and absorb and connecting um, and and kind of changing the way I, I see things yeah. was the was the bigger impact. That's so right. So shout out to shout out to people like uh, Dr. Yusuf Ismail Maha Al Ganadi at ING. And uh, Sister Amina Jandalit ING, that was a greater organization. And a few other places that, um, you know, um, uh, Rahima, Rahima Foundation was another place that, that uh, so this, it was a lot of good experiences in the early 2000s. And, I've, and then, of course, um, you know, you get married and you have kids and you grow in your career. And so I really, I really didn't, you know, I've kind of moved away from, um, from being super active in the community. Um, it was funny when I when I moved to Union City, I bought a house in 2007. Mm -hmm. Literally a few weeks after I bought that, I was super excited to be near Zaytun mm -hmm. Institute. A couple weeks later, I found out they're moving. So um, yeah, that's right. That would have been like 2008, 2009, yeah. I guess, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. But right at the time that they were going to try to move up to Berkeley. That's right. Mm -hmm. Right. No, so it's 2007, summer mm -hmm. 2007, when they announced it, mm -hmm. and I and I moved there. So you know, just acknowledgement that I, I you know I, I definitely um, I definitely admire people who who uh, sacrifice, day, you know, week in, week out to, to stay super involved in the community after they have kids and, and, and whatnot, mm -hmm. um, because it takes a lot of sacrifice. And, you know, I've kind of been more, been more um, into things like family life and whatnot for the first several years. So I'm not, I'm not as visible in the community, but um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's exciting to, it'll be exciting to reconnect with folks and yeah, maybe have go. really this interesting is... conversations and, 
go from there. That's right. Um, and, and then, so I, I guess, I mean, you know, we're already at about an hour already into the show, um, which is, which is super exciting. Um, uh, and, and I'm, you know, really excited to have you on the show. And I think this has been really good in terms of just kind of giving our listeners an opportunity to get to know you a little bit. Um, I know one of the things that you and I, um, you know, it has, we, we have been on this sort of a little bit of a hiatus and, um, but, but I feel like a lot has happened. Mm -hmm. um, that we as just people, as human beings and as, as people are, have, have kind of responded to. And, and I kind of wanted to kind of talk about that a little bit before we kind of close out the episode, which is, um, I, I guess, primarily and, and not, not to be, um, what's the word um, I'm looking for, but like, to, you know, to talk about the death of, uh, I think, people that we admired in mm -hmm. our lives and, and that sort of really kind of bringing in the new year like that and, and, and having to respond to that. And maybe you and I can kind of talk, talk a little bit about that because, um, and, and, and specifically here, um, the, I know both of us responded to the death of um, Kobe Bryant and, um, and then also uh, a little less known person, probably outside of people who, who listen to Rush, but um, the drummer for Rush, Neil Peart, uh, dying at the age of 67 of uh, brain cancer. So, you know, both of us kind of responding to that, those events kind of weeks apart. Um, maybe talk a little bit about that. I mean, I know yeah. Kobe, you responded to one, maybe a little bit more than the other, and I responded to one, maybe more than the other. But. Yeah, it, it, and, it, and it does tie back because yeah. uh, for for those of you, you, you I'm sure, I'm sure you... If if you've listened to the show, you know Parvez is a diehard Rush fan. When when I went, went in '89, summer of '89, when I visited him for about six seven weeks, stayed with him. Uh, we were roommates for those for that whole entire time. And aside from things like uh, you know being a good example in terms of things like prayer and and whatnot, he he introduced me to Rush. So we would ring Guilty. in ring in the mornings with the Spirit of Radio and and close out with the Manhattan Project or something like that. But basically, those are those are just classic Rush songs. And um, he's a diehard fan. So yeah. he texted me. You texted me in in late December saying he had passed away, and we were both pretty shocked. Early right? early January. Yeah, early yeah, January. Exactly. Yeah, I was in Austin. Um, and uh, your namesake, but a, a childhood friend of mine, Omar Sami, who he and I, I was introduced to Rush through him and his older brother. Um, but, um, you know, uh, it was just a complete shock. So yeah. to give you an idea, and, and I'm, I'm really unabashed about this. I don't know if I actually talked about this on the show. So to, to, okay. to go back to a point you made, I don't know if the listeners necessarily know, outside of people who know me personally, know that I, how much of a diehard Rush fan I was, or I am. Um, you know, Rush being a Canadian progressive rock band since the uh, mid or mid uh, 70s, early 70s, um, huge, huge huge part of my life um, um, ever since I was 15. And, and so when you came in 89, I had just begun my Rush fandom. Um, but even by then, I think I had every album, I had every record of theirs. No, we bought um, them. Like I literally remember that summer, cassettes. that was like a thing we did. You were on a mission, I no was. pun intended. No. That's a famous Rush song. No pun intended nice. to find their buy their tapes tapes by the way yeah, not yeah, CDs. Yeah. i was buying cassettes and we right. were we you, we literally throughout the course of that summer you went from having like one or two to like the entire collection wow, so i was there wow. when when that happened that's amazing yeah because yeah. no, i i remember um buying all of those tapes and just going back and discovering the catalog of music um because i i had gotten into them you know with some of their more recent at that again at that time recent albums and then i kind of went back and rediscovered all of their early music. But um, I think even when you came in 89, I, I mean, there's probably not a square inch of my wall that didn't have like a poster or something of Rush. I mean, I was, I was deep, yeah. steep in yeah. the fandom. Um, and, 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 a, and a big part of that reason, apart from enjoying the music and what have you, was the importance of the lyrics and, and, and what the lyrics conveyed. They, you know, Rush, for those who've listened to the band know, they're not your sort of standard sort of rock band. They don't talk about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Yeah. Um, and, and to be honest with you, I mean, that was kind of a negotiation in my mind, kind of navigating my own Muslim history, my own Muslim identity in the sense that, you know, music always being kind of a touchy feely topic. And we're, I'm not here to, you know, we're not here to make a fick argument for or against music, but nonetheless, I listened to music, but the way I negotiated that at the very minimum was, well, I'm going to listen to music or listen to, yeah, listen to music where the lyrics are not about sex, drugs, and mm -hmm. rock and roll. I want something more meaningful. And certainly Rush, yes. and in particular, Neil Peart, 
being the drummer, both the drummer and the lyricist for Rush, um, we had a, just a huge yes. impact. He's singing. He t- he's singing about. Well, he he's not singing. Oh, but, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. He's <laughs> writing lyrics that are being sung. <laughs> Thank you. About things like the meaning of life, yeah. sacrifice, yeah. pushing your pushing your limits, yeah. uh, resisting things in life that you're supposed to resist. Yeah. Um, Time stands still yeah. about, about, about growing up and, and, you know, uh, things fleeting. I mean, yeah. kind of topical that we're talking about this yeah. now, uh, you know, cherishing the people in your lives, things like that. Yeah. Like you said, you, you, you brought up a song called mission. I mean, you know, he's talking about, yeah, these larger than life yeah. sort of like meta questions. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and so for me, that's why the music of Rush was so meaningful um, and, and so impactful. And I remained, that, 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 that sort of fandom remained. And my wife and my children can tell you how much of, 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 of a fan I remain to this day. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, hearing the, um, the like the death of, about the death of Neil Peart, which really came out of left field because he was a very private person. So not a lot of people knew he had been, you know, um, battling cancer for three plus years. Another memory that will I will always cherish is that you and I made the road trip down to LA to see what we knew at the time and now certainly will be the case was their last ever concert. That was an amazing, amazing time with your brother and uh, the Sami brothers oh, from right. Houston. <laughs> and there's something, it wasn't just you. There was a huge yeah. following in the Muslim community in Houston oh, yeah. uh, for Rush. And it might've been for those same reasons. They're talking about things that growing up we're thinking about because our parents are telling us there's nothing more important than being a Muslim, mm-hmm. being spiritual, being good. And those are the things that they're singing about. They're not singing about, like you said, sex, drugs, rock and roll. So it's really resonating. They're speaking in in, in American cultural language, yeah. but they're touching on topics our parents are in for, so it really went well together. Very right? true. Very true. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, talking about conformity yeah. and, and peer pressure, right? Subdivision. Right. So, I mean, so, and, and again, it, 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 it not only did the lyrics resonate, um, and, and when I was introduced in my time, like as a young Muslim American immigrant teenager, so much of that resonated, um, feelings of belonging and conformity and, 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 and feeling as though you are the loner or the, the, like the misfit. Um, so alone. Yeah. yeah. And I'm a huge Rush <laughs> fan too. That's just, right. Just for like, I can't compete with Perez, but they're definitely, yeah, um, yeah. they're definitely one, but, one of my favorite bands. And then, uh, then of course, a few weeks later, mm-hmm. you know, comes the tragedy of Kobe Bryant and his daughter. And I know you being a huge basketball fan, I mean, yeah. way bigger than me. So like, I mean, for me, you know, uh, I'm almost stuck in an era. Like to me, the Rockets, you know, in the mid '90s, that's my that's my kind of foray into into basketball fandom. But for you, it remained. I mean, you're you're a huge sports fan. Yeah, uh, yeah. definitely. And and it, and it does tie back to my Muslim identity because remember, I'm watching Kareem Abdul Jabbar, yeah. cha- you know, as a as a Laker fan in the in the late '80s, mm-hmm. and then I'm watching Hakeem, the Dream, Olajuwon in the '90s, and he's fasting. And he's doing it publicly and he's playing games where he's dominating the Michael Jordan Bulls, but he's holding on to the net from fa- exhaustion from fasting. And Bill Walton and all these guys are talking about him being Muslim and fasting. And, and I have no Muslim role models That's right. in the community. Yeah. So I have these sports figures. So for, for me, basketball is a huge part. Um, you know, I'm not somebody who spends hours and hours a week mm-hmm. watching. I'll, 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 I follow it, but I do love the game. Mm-hmm. And uh, obviously Kobe Bryant, epitomizes basketball from the late 90s to the mid 2000 teens right and uh, when people you know people you see celebrities dying all the time That's usually right. drug overdoses mm-hmm. suicides or old age or what have you right mm-hmm. um kobe bryant was super young in his prime really as a human being as a man uh just starting his family he he had overcome you know, um, foibles or, or weaknesses or whatever mistakes. And, and at least from what it seemed, he was really becoming a better person. Um, that was, that was an admirable thing about Kobe. He, he always tried to be a better person, try to improve himself, whether it's on the court or off. So you saw him with his, with his, with his daughters. I'm, I'm a father of daughters too, two daughters, just like Perez. Exactly. Both um, of us. So yeah, that was impactful. I mean, I, I usually don't get don't get too emotional for from deaths of celebrities. I'm just like, oh, that's a shame. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, that was that was hard, hard, hard because it came out of left field, and he was in his prime. He was our age. He was healthy. He kind of epitom- epitomized like 
youth and vigor mm-hmm. um, and and still doing things with this. I said it's hard to see, but you know, it gets you thinking as as you as I I've been thinking about this for the past couple of years after I turned 40. It's like, wow, time's moving fast. Yeah. Kids are growing up. Time is not standing still. Um, yeah, it's so it just got you thinking. And and yeah, there's nothing you can really do other than the fragility of life. Yeah. And I mean, you know, Kobe had certainly moved on to another, like another stage of his, of his progression, um, really focusing on, you know, his daughters and, and, and just being a father and, and being kind of a role model to young athletes. Um, so yeah, that, I mean, that, that certainly hit me as well, even though, you know, but like I said, I, I, I didn't, um, I wasn't as big of a sports fan at the time or the era that Kobe played. So for me, you know, he was sort of like a heir apparent to Jordan. And I remember the Jordan era, but just obviously, you know, kind of almost even from a side, kind of obviously following Kobe's career and, and just his, what he accomplished in the game. Um, but yeah, just when you respond to tragedy like that, and, and like I said, for me, it was kind of back to back. It was, you know, um, Neil Peart, and then it was, you know, Kobe Bryant. Um, and, and I think it's, I don't want to say worth mentioning, but probably worth noting, at least in the sense that as Muslims, when we respond to these deaths, right, and, and, and you know, I'm, I'm almost tired of the conversations that take place on social media, but notwithstanding those conversations, I think it's important to note, I mean, one can mourn the loss of someone that we, that, that you admire, be they Muslim or not. And we're not making any kind of, um, uh, we're not, res- we're not making any judgments about their salvific sort of disposition, like their akhira, as it were They're you know, I mean, we're not here to judge. I mean, in fact, the Quran tells us, I mean, you, you aren't here to judge, um, you know? And so, I mean, again, that rests with Allah, that rests with God. Um, what we're responding to and what I think people are responding to, and just kind of give people the space and the time to respond to the loss of people that they admire, be they Muslim or not, is just that. It's just that they're mourning the loss of someone. They're not making a um, a statement about their salvific sort of uh, you know disposition. So I just kind of, I don't know. I just feel like uh, at least commenting on that, um, you know, because like I said, so much of conversations around social media that I've seen at least is like, oh, RIP Kobe Bryant. Oh, but Kobe Bryant, you know, was this and Kobe Bryant wasn't Muslim. And so it's like, Man, come on, people! Yeah. Like, let let someone just grieve or mourn, grieve or mourn, and, and just give them this spite, like this time and space to do that. So, and it's really just, yeah. it's really it's the mirror into your own, mm. your own That's life, true. right? It's it's you know you you know Kobe Kobe's daughter. I think of my daughter, right? Um, you you just realize where you're at in life. That That's life true. is not slowing down. Yeah. Um, it could have been. It could be you. Mm-hmm. Um, you're not any any more immortal than Kobe Bryant or less or what have you. Yeah. Um, if you know if it could happen to him, it could happen to anybody. Right. And then just all those things. And and like I said, our kids are growing up, um, children growing up, <laughs> friends growing old. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um so yeah, it's just a, just a wake up call and a lot to think about and you know, you just try to, to stay, you try to enjoy, enjoy times, um, appreciate, appreciate your, your loved ones, stay healthy. Yeah. Exactly. Um, do the best you can do the right thing. Mm-hmm, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, certainly, yeah, you, you, you respond to the fragility of life and you certainly begin reflecting on your own legacy. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And whether it's your legacy as a father, as a brother, as a member of the community, as a, you know, as a husband, uh, you know, so all yeah. of those things, um, bad transition, but I guess as we close out, um, what what are you like what excites you about the show like what are you excited about um in terms of what the show so I, i'm not gonna lie a yeah. part of it a part a big part of me is just hanging out with you awesome yeah I, that's 100 percent true because like i said there's a ton of uh brothers and sisters in the community who could do a much better job than me um a ton, right? That remains to be seen. Let's see. No, no, for sure, for sure. I mean, there's just there's just so many I can I can yeah. think of. But um like I said, I'll try to offer I'll try to that offer that every every man every you know every Muslim point of view uh, somebody who grew up in a small town, mm-hmm. uh really grew up with all non-Muslim friends mm-hmm. and 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 even through college. Uh so I, I can hopefully offer that perspective. And then like I said, just spending time with you. Um, and then, and then, you know, we've covered a ton of origin stories. I think we are now talking about what, where, where do we go? Because there, there's, there's lots of, there's lots of great stories out there. Um, you've covered a lot of them. There's plenty more, obviously, but 
where do you, where do you take the show? And we've talked about maybe focusing on yeah. topics instead of people stories. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe we talk about things like parenthood, uh, the things that, or marriage or uh, living in the Silicon Valley and the pressures of work versus work-life balance or the passage of time, like we we're talking about. All these things that people who are I'm, listeners of the show, I don't know, we haven't done a demographic study, but presumably listeners of the show are interested in these topics, right? Mm-hmm. We, we're trying to be good Muslims and, and keep our faith, but we're also thinking about parenting and marriage and our careers and aging and taking care of our parents, work-life balance. And fun, And then we're, we're interested in fun, in fun leisurely topics mm-hmm. like sports and arts and film. Mm -hmm. We talked about Star Wars last time, music, um, travel, cooking, right? There's all these interesting topics that uh, are engaging to us as Muslims in America and as just as as people. Uh, It might be interesting to focus a little about on those things, right? And bring in panels, bring in people who don't necessarily have, um, they don't necessarily want to even want to necessarily share their origin story or that they want to talk about something uh, important that resonates um, with our with with us and with our listeners, yeah, and and I I, I certainly welcomed that input um, because, like you said, I, I think you know the history of the show, show thus far, by and large. I mean, obviously, there's been exceptions, but by and large, has been focused on personalities, and there's nothing wrong with that. And like you said, we'll continue to do that and share people's personal narratives and journeys. But I think there is, um, yeah, to use the platform of the show to to engage in conversations. Um, around these topics that I think are important to, to to all of our listeners, regardless of age or demographics. So I I, I really welcomed that input and and the, the, that that kind of idea. You certainly planted the seed, and uh, you know I mean frankly I I love this as an opportunity to to engage with our listeners. Tell us topics. I know you mentioned a few like you know, things that are near to us, like rearing children and being the father of two daughters and, you know, uh, you know, work-life balance, et cetera. Uh, but what are topics that, you know, you as listeners would like to, would, would like for us to engage? Yeah. Right. So, so and, do hit, hit us up and um, send us a, you know, send us your thoughts, um, whether it's uh, by email, diffusecongruence at gmail.com, or, um, you know, even just comment on, on, on our, on our Facebook page. Yeah. It's a platform to, to talk about things that maybe should be, but aren't being talked about all the time. Um, not not to get too controversial, but just things that you know you want to hear about in in, in your Jum'ah khutbah. You're not necessarily hearing about, right. or just something you're thinking about that's troubling you, or you're thinking about or contemplating. Um, hopefully, the show can can address those. It's still meant to the 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 the, 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 the uh, mission of the show is still meant to be like a, a time capsule that you could you could record and then maybe you know 10 20 years from now 50 years from now somebody finds it they'll get a good understanding of what was going on in the muslim american community at the time that's right so the people are very important but so are the, what are we thinking about right. um so this this is a chance so yeah p- people should write in um if, if you have if you you know if you have us um uh, if you have us uh, a chance to talk to us directly whether it's phone email in person text whatever just let us know any way you can about what you want to hear about we're super open to it uh, looking forward to taking the show to, you know, continuing the, what, what, and build on the, what the show's already done. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I'm really excited and looking forward to that. So uh, as I've already sort of mentioned, um, you know, um, please do reach out to us. Uh, tell us your thoughts, your feedback, um, you know, leave us uh, a, a rating or a review on, on, on iTunes or wherever you find fine podcasts. Um, but as I mentioned, uh, you can hit us up on Facebook, facebook.com slash Diffuse Congruence. You can also email us at Diffuse Congruence at gmail.com. So um, we are really excited and um, looking forward to future conversations that we're about to have. So thank you for listening and join us again for our next episode of Diffuse Congruence. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Take care.